Saturday, August 19th, a hot summer night in Los Angeles. Where are you going to be? I just ran away from home. Now I'm going to Disneyland. Nah, you're going to be at the Roxy with Seven Horse. I got it! Seven Horse with Mike Dawson and the Smoking Kills. In the city of the angels. Los Angeles. Just another summer. California. Hot summer night. California. Tickets available now at sevenhorsemusic.com. Seven Horse. Mike Dawson and the Smoking Kills. And for the first time in a long time, Dada reunite. Summer night in Los Angeles. Seven Horse, Donna, and Mike Dawson and the Smoking Kills. August 19th at the Roxy on the historic Sunset Strip. Get your tickets now at sevenhorsemusic.com. Hi, this is Bobby Brown, and welcome to another fucking podcast. You kids with your loud music and your Dan Fogelberg, your Zima, hula hoops, and Pac Man video games, don't you see? People today have attention spans that can only be measured in nanoseconds. See, son, old legends never die. They just lose weight. It's like a legend and an out of work bum with a lot of light. Hello, you crazy dead fucker! Body time! Yes, it is party time. Hello, Las Vegas. Hello, world. Hello, my loyal minions. It is good to see you, and it's always good to be seen. My name is Izzy Presley, and this is another fucking cut co- pot co- podcast. Podcast. I, I can't even talk. I don't have beers. I think that's the problem because it's noon. And I'm not going to start drinking at noon because I have to go back to work after this. So I'm being a responsible adult, and uh, we're going to go and roll with this very special Tuesday noon edition of the show because one i have plans this evening and two it worked out best for my guest who i will be gracing the stage with with the band i am lucky enough to be in called mike dawson and the smoking kills this saturday night ladies and gentlemen run do not walk to your ticket office the roxy theater in beautiful west hollywood california we are honored to play with Seven Horse and the Dada Reunion. It is going to be a great time. And joining me is the drummer for Dada and Seven Horse, Mr. Fell Levitt. Good morning, sir. Good morning. It's quite early. This I just got up, so bear with nice. me. Now, well, I'm jealous of those glasses, though. Those are Thank fucking you. pimp glasses. I enjoy yeah. those. those. Those go well with my high-class dapper persona. Um, so let's talk about this. Let's start off talking about the show. Um, when did... Uh, at what point after it was booked did it you decide that you know what maybe we should do the dada thing too well you know uh we've been talking about uh reuniting the band for a while and uh really what it started with was an invitation to guitarist michael Gurley to get up with us and just do a you know because it's uh my partner joey's uh got a birthday coming up here this week so we were kind of celebrating oh. his birthday at the show as well his birthday's on thursday so nice. we were going to you know, celebrate the birthday at the show. And then we thought, well, let's get Mike up. And we haven't played together in years as uh, Dada. Uh, The last tour we did was 2017. So we invited him up for a song and he went, well, if I'm coming up for one, I want to do a whole set. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. You know, I I thought that would uh, just uh, excite the Dada fan base. And, uh, you know, I'm always trying to put as pack as much value entertainment value for the dollar into a show i know how tough it is for people to come out i mean live music you know took a massive hit during the uh yeah the covid uh, pandemic but it has been making a rebound but i just want to give people as much of a reason to come out as they can and when Gurley said hey i want to do a whole set i said now i got him okay you're on let's do it yeah and, and you said it's been since what 2017 it's uh so you guys I didn't. I usually don't do a lot of research for these interviews to like it to be like fresh and real, like a real conversation. But I listened to the Corolla interview twice, okay. um, and there was so you guys did a reunion tour. It was a, yeah. it was a tour, right? It wasn't a show. It was yeah, a tour. that was a full on U.S. tour in 2017 that uh, almost blew up and and cost the. I mean, we almost 
called it quits after that because we had a uh, we had an issue in New Orleans. You know, at that time, Gurley was was working with uh, a television and movie star as his uh, a guy who has a who has a music project as well. I'm not going to name names. I don't want to throw okay. him under the bus. But uh, he was worked. Everybody, if, if anybody, if the people that know Mike Gurley know who he was playing with, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it, it took. I really moved heaven and earth to book this tour and get him clear on his schedule. And once we were booked, then this a lister decided to book a, a competing show on the same day we were supposed to be in New Orleans on a oh, okay on a Saturday night. We 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 went to New Orleans and uh, unfortunately. Um, on that show, a uh, girlie decided he had to play with the A-list celebrity in Louisville, and uh, we went up on stage in New Orleans without him. It was a fiasco, man, and 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 it was really uh, devastating to me because I had busted my ass putting yeah. this tour together. You know how hard it is, man, to yep. get these oh, things, yeah. especially when you're doing it yourself. So that really was a uh, that was a hump that I didn't wasn't sure we were going to get over. But look. Water under the bridge. Yeah. Time has passed. Some things are bigger than a particular moment in time. Look, it's been over 30 years that we've played together. Yeah. We did a lot of cool things together back in the 90s. We've toured all through the 2000s. And, uh, you know, I'm willing to just move on. I mean, we've been through, we've all been through a lot. And if we all, if we, if, if we've learned one thing over the past three, several years, it's that we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. You have a chance to get up and do something cool with old friends and play music that you really care about and that people still care about. Thirty years later, I say, let's do it. So, so uh, we that did. that that show. I mean, did you do it? Did you have somebody fill in, or how how did you do it? Yeah, I <laughs> we flew a guy out from L.A. a okay. uh, a very talented musician who had worked with us on uh, some of the seven horse stuff. And we said, we said, look, uh, we're going to do this kind of hybrid show, seven horse. We're going to do some Dada songs. He came to new Orleans and it was like one of those Broadway kind of moments where I, I, I got up on stage right before the start of the set and said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, due to circumstances beyond our control, uh, Michael Gurley will not be joining us this evening. And they, you know, jaws were on the ground. Yeah. Uh, but I rallied the crowd and we got up there and we did a show and there were not too many people that, that, uh, that protested. We did have a couple of drunk people in the back that were not too happy, but, and we do, we, we owe New Orleans a gig uh, at this point. So we're going to, we're going to get back there, but uh, you know, the show must go on. That's my motto. It's like, I'm not, canceling a Saturday night in New Orleans for anything, especially since we were booked first. So it was a matter right. of principle. And we did what we had to do. And he did what he thought he had to do. But it did drive a wedge into the band. And it was very difficult to get over it. And if you know anything, as I know you do, about band politics and yep. relationships, it's tough, man. It's tough. But look, we're on the other side of it. And uh, we're all really excited about doing this thing on Saturday. He's actually coming over to my house today to rehearse oh, nice. in an hour. Nice. So, you know, we're, uh, we're like, grow- we're going to be grown ups and move on. That Dude, that's what it's all about. But it's funny though, is today it's kind of the norm. Everybody's got a fill in ready to go. I mean, I, I mean, Christ kiss has been doing it since 2000 after the, after the quote unquote farewell tour, you know, they've yeah. got people dressed up as Peter and Ace, right. you know? I mean, you know, it's really the songs, the music, the songs, yeah. I mean, it, it, whatever, you know, I think this has been proven out by, look, there's nobody in Foreigner that was exactly in there's nobody. Exactly. They don't have anybody. Exactly. And they're still out there doing it. So it's like, look, uh, it's the songs you want to present the songs in their in their most authentic form. I mean, we're, you know, you don't want to be a cover band doing it. Right. But, um, you know, we got the guy, the guy who sings Disneyland is in the other room right now. It's my my partner. Um, So, you know, we have, it's often, but look, Saturday night, it's all original members. It's the three of us from the beginning. It's the same guys. So uh, we are taking it, we're we're taking it back to, uh, to ground zero there. Well, dude, that's great, and uh, I'm honored to be part of it. It's, hey, it's well, you know what? We're, we're really excited to have you guys up. I mean, I've known Mike for a while. Mike and I yeah. are, are friends for for many years now. Super talented guy and, and incredible uh, yeah. voice artist, uh, as we've heard on the commercials. And we're you know we're really excited to have you guys on the bill. Well, I, like I'm just a guitar player, but the fact that I get to 
I've never played the Roxy before. So this, I mean, this is a first for me, you know, I mean, the only place I've played on the strip is the Viper room. So this is, right. this is really a big deal. I mean, personally for me, but obviously for the band, it's more important, That's you know, awesome, but, it, but it's great, man. Roxy's a great room. 50 years on the sunset strip. They're celebrating this year. I think Neil Young is coming back in a month or something to play an anniversary show there. Cause he opened the room. 50 oh, years. wow. Yeah. He opened it 50 years ago and I think they're doing a, a, a anniversary show there, but look, anytime, you get on one of these iconic stages and it, you know, I mean, the, you know, the list of names that have played that room is pretty staggering. Yep. Uh, so it's a great, you know, for musicians, we, we love it. And it's uh, it's great. They do, they do know how to put on a show there and the crew there is great. And uh, the sound, it's a room that's designed for music. So it's yep. really a great place to play. So how long, at what point after, um, after, Dada broke up. Did Seven Horse start? Well, you know, Dada didn't really ever officially break up, and that's okay. why we went on hiatus. And really, uh, you know, it's all tied together because Seven Horse started in 2011, and it was really, okay. it was really an offshoot of an inability to get the original members of Dada into the studio. The mm -hmm. same situation was brewing then. We were trying to make a record. Couldn't get everybody on the same page to do it. Joey and I were just frustrated. And our engineer was like, look, we got this time booked. Why don't you guys just come down and just do something, you know, just use mm -hmm. the time. So we went in and we've been kicking around a lot of different ideas. We were talking about the blues and stuff. And he had this riff for a meth lab Zoso sticker and sent me the riff on an iPhone, you know, because we're in different states. He lives in yeah. Washington. I'm here in L.A. We're writing you know, uh, from two different places. He sends me a riff on the phone that says Meth Lab Zoso Sticker, which is just the lead off riff. Never intending for that to be the title of the song, but I saw yeah. that. I was like, hey, this is pretty cool. And then I kind of started, I was thinking a lot about old blues, Chicago blues, Muddy Waters, Delta yeah. blues, and that kind of swagger that those guys brought to their to their blues. And so I wrote a lyric around that. And that's the first thing we cut. And uh, that's the song that kind of took off for us. So you never yeah. know, you know. Oh well, yeah, it's it's just weird. It's like you never know how shit's gonna happen. It just yeah. it just does. So do you you guys perform as a two piece? We do we do it a lot of different ways. This show okay. we're, gonna be, we're gonna be a five piece at the Rock. Oh wow! Oh wow! Three, okay. Yeah, we got three people joining us. Uh, we're gonna you know we've played a lot as a just a two piece. Uh, we added a bass player at one time. We went to three. I've got a friend. Actually, uh, there's another uh, connection to Las Vegas. It's going to be in our band. Um, MK, our bass player, and I both uh, worked at Blue Man in Vegas yeah. uh, in the 2000s. So he's in the band. And uh, <clears throat> we have uh, Allison Scaliotti playing uh, rhythm guitar and singing and uh, Doris Bailey playing keyboard. So we've got a, a, a multi-gender uh, five piece that's going to be okay. at the Roxy. And then, uh, you know, but Joey and I will go out and do it as a two piece as well. So when you do it as a two piece, are you using tracks or how are you doing it? We've done it both ways. We'd used, uh, at one point we added, you know, he plays a lot in open tuning. So we've got the drone going, we've got the bottom, yeah. it's like an open G on a, on a Gretsch. So it's droning. So, and, uh, and the bass drum takes up a lot of the bottom. So we've done it just raw as a two piece. And we've also done it with rolling bass tracks that I'm listening to in ears. Yeah. Both ways will work because there's so much bottom end coming off the guitar and he can boost it on the amp that you don't really miss it. You don't notice it that much if it's not there at all because the guitar is so powerful in the mix. So it's kind of fun to just do it without any machines, without any computers. It's more yeah. immediate that way. I prefer it, you know? Yeah, well, I, I I know there's a lot of people that prefer it that way too, that they, yeah. they just hate tracks. It's like, dude, if you can't fucking do it live, why are you doing it? Right. You know, other than like random keyboard parts and bringing a keyboard player for like yeah, one I mean, song, you, you know? know? As a drummer, man, I you know, I've played a lot with click tracks, obviously in the studio and I've done it live yeah. as well. And on one level, it removes all responsibility for timekeeping because all you have to do is play along and and you know the 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 arguments that take place between Ben Bamber hey you sped up it's like no I didn't I'm playing with this thing. Okay. <laughs> but but I do like to have the ability to be free with the feel and sometimes things do need to lean forward a little bit you know yeah and, and the as the intensity comes up in the music you want to be able to 
push the front end of the tempo. And you can't really do that when you're playing with a click track. Right. Well, there's this guy on uh, YouTube. It's like the, the rhythm doctor or something like that. And he time corrected oh, yeah. Van Halen running with the devil and it yeah. ruined the song. Right. You know, Same thing with Bono. I mean, it's like this, the natural swing isn't yeah. dead center of the beat. I mean, then this is getting a little nerdy, but I'm, you probably have some musicians listening to your podcast. I do. Yes. And we all know, I mean, it's like, here's the beat, but the beats actually this wide and you can be over yeah. here or you can be up here. And that's the artistry of drummers grooving. That's what groove and feel is about. It's exactly. not playing dead center all the time. And you really, it, it, you can do it when you're playing with the click. You can be on the backside while the click is just ahead of you. And it can work, but you know, for a live, the emotion of the moment, you want to be, for me anyway, I prefer just to, I'm the timekeeper. Like Ringo used to say, I'm yeah. the play. <laughs> well, it's funny. It's like, I think I always say this, that Peter Chris and Ringo Starr, while hailed by musicians are usually the most underrated and most made fun of drummers out there. Yeah. And it's sad because I mean, both of them are just monster players. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit, you know, look, it's how we judge musicians. It, it, you know, a lot of the times it's like a sport. Most people look at it like a sport where it's yeah. the fastest, the most complicated, the guy who's doing the most technical things is the best. For me, that isn't the truth. That isn't really how I look at me. For me, what I'm most interested in are songs, first yeah. and foremost. Those are the things that you remember. Look, nowadays, I mean, when we were coming up, you didn't have the level of technical proficiency among eight-year-olds that we have yeah. now. There's kids out there on YouTube and on TikTok that are absolutely shredding with technique on all instruments. Yep. And we never had that. I mean, there maybe there was one person who could play like that back when we were coming up. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody plays like that. So, but what hasn't improved is songwriting. Exactly. You know, we don't see that on the level. You know, there are still great songwriters out there, but it isn't like we've taken quantum leaps ahead in songwriting, whereas we have with technical facility in players. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't judge musicians as much by their chops i mean you got to have chops right but there's all kinds of different chops there's pure technical chops there's you know crazy mathematical you know uh, uh ways to break down rhythm and then there's groove and feel and sometimes yeah. that's the simplest shit there is and and that can be the hardest stuff to do consistently over time if you listen to great studio musicians it's not that they're playing the most complicated shit it's mm -hmm. just that laying down this this river of time that everything is happening on top of and it's just flowing and some people look at that and say well that's super easy well do it in a band setting with the red light on when it really counts yep back in the 60s or 70s when there wasn't pro tools and you had yeah. to be great. you had to be great or yep. you're out you yeah know, those are different that, those are different kind of players well it's, it's funny it's like i mean you listen how often do you hear ACDC done correctly? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. they, people say, oh, it's the easiest stuff. Go ahead and play it. Play it right. Let's see what happens. Yeah. I mean, you know? it takes discipline and taste and restraint and commitment to a groove, like groove commitment. It's something we've been talking about in Seven Horse since the beginning. Like, let's get committed to a thing and let's make it hypnotic. That's a skill in and of itself beyond just like, I can blow a bunch of complicated hand and foot chops. That's super cool. Yeah. I like listening to it, but that doesn't make a great song necessarily. Right. Well, I think the problem is too, it's like when, when we were coming up, we didn't have all the technology to sit down and yeah, like I, I, had, I had guitar tab books, you know, but I didn't have YouTube tutorials and you had to go to lessons and it was a whole thing. You know I mean? You, you really developed your own style. And I always say it's always, it's in the hands. You know, yeah, it's man. all in the hands. Um, but it's like now it's like you just have clones. Yeah. You know? Well, you see a lot of people play. It's like it's great that you can play Eruption or that you, you are a drummer yeah. can play Tom Sawyer. That's great. But it's not even the fact that what he played, it's that he thought of it. You know, yeah, That's exactly. You hear the greatest, not the technical facility of because a lot can because literally there are 12 year old kids that can blow Tom Sawyer note for note on the drums. Yeah. But he thought of that stuff. Exactly. That, that's the cool part. Those are his parts. That's his construction. That's his composition. And, you know, that's what sets musicians apart is composition ability, not necessarily pure technical chops. 
Amen. Uh, so you said you were in the, uh, you, you did the blue man group. Um, yeah. How, one, how did you get involved with that? And then were you, were you playing with Bloss? Bloss yeah. Elias? Yeah, he was in the band. Yeah. I got, you know, that thing was one of those things where you're desperate for something like we, this was late nineties. Dada got dropped on MCA records mm-hmm. um, in uh, 99. Uh, I was getting divorced and going bankrupt after coming out of a major record deal. That's a typical story, right? And so I'm like at the bottom and uh, I open up the LA Weekly one day and I see an ad for uh, Open Call for Blue Man Group. They're putting a new production into Las Vegas. And I was somewhat familiar with it, but I sent some material into them and I got a call to, to come out and audition here in LA, pass that audition with I don't know the room, the the thing. There's musicians all over the place. Hundreds yeah. of guys came out and uh, ended up getting a call back going to New York. And I was just kind of rolling with it because I really needed a gig. Yeah, and got got the gig. And for me, Vegas is. I was born there. It's my yeah. hometown. So to come back to Las Vegas in the early 2000s as part of this show when it was just moving into the Luxor was uh, so on time for me. And um, the experience with all these different musicians from all over the country, all over the world, really yeah. um, made some incredible friends. There guys that are still there, Elvis Letterer, uh, Jordan Cohn, a great friend of mine, Todd Waitzig, tremendous drummer. Um, uh, all the guys there, Bloss, uh, um, uh, Tim from Primus was in the band. For oh, wow. Wow. And, yeah. We had some monster drummers in that show monster man guitar players and you know thad korea and uh just just great players and great and it, what's so great about a show um the theater experience is that that kind of instant family you know when you move all these people to vegas at the same yeah. time to mount this production everybody really is drawn together and uh we became very close and and i mean 2000 2001 2002 man we were tearing it up in las vegas tearing it up (laughs) that was great so did you enjoy your time back here oh yeah i mean i'm you know i'm considering moving back again i mean i I, there's something about vegas that always has a yeah hold on me it's my hometown i was born there like i said but yeah i i mean i i enjoyed it i loved coming back there and living there for a couple of years uh you know, the heat hit me like a blast furnace. And uh, that's something you have to be prepared for when you walk right, out. Right. Coming out of the old drays at, at uh, 7 a.m. Just like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I mean, it was a great time in my life there. And uh, we really, we really had some a, a good time. And it's great playing that music because it's a drum center, yeah. drum army, you know. Yeah, so I haven't it, seen it yet. I, I've been invited. I just... I didn't yeah. have any trim to take with me. You can't go to that show without a date. Sure. You know? I hear you. Uh, yeah, so- it, it was an, it was a magical uh, time, and and one of those things like I'm, I'm sure it's happened to you, in you and in your life. Like just when you're like, what am I going to do next? All of a sudden, something arrives. You know, if yeah. you're open to the next thing, and it was right on time for me. So I'll always be uh, have a fond connection to Blue Man. How old were you when you moved to L.A.? I was just a kid. I was uh, 14 oh, okay. years old. Uh, uh, yeah, my, my parents got divorced and my mom and I came out here when I was 14. So, you know, I feel like an Angelino in a certain sense because everybody comes from somewhere else here for the most part. But being born in Vegas, you know, when I when I was a kid there and you told somebody you were from Las Vegas, you were born there. People were like, I didn't know anybody was born there. <laughs> because, you know, it was all people that came from Chicago or Kansas City. Or, you know, my family came from Chicago out there. My my grandfather was in the gambling business in Chicago. Yeah. Came with all those guys in the early 60s to start basically building Las Vegas. And um, yeah, he worked at the old Stardust for 22 years. That was my first summer job. I was a busboy there when I was 14. Oh, wow. Yeah, I came back after we moved. I came back that first summer. My grandfather, who had a lot of juice in town, got me into the Culinary Workers Union at age 14. Wow. And, you know, people in that, you know, weren't even supposed to be in a casino. I was right. working in one. So it was a pretty crazy time. Uh, you, uh, you you had talked about that you were a songwriter uh, yeah. before before Dada happened. And so you were doing the songwriting when the Great Wall of Nirvana hit. And yeah how how long how because i know that didn't really because i know you said you're like 
trying to write for like Whitney Houston and kind well, of Well, I mean, yeah, we we were the the songwriting deal was I mean, we I had a partner, we got a publishing deal, one of these they, I don't even know if they do them anymore, but in those days you could get a deal where they signed you and you had to deliver 10, 11, 12 songs a year and you get these yeah. little demo budgets. And uh you know, you, you get an advance on that. I think we we got maybe we split fifteen thousand dollars but you could live on it for a year in in yeah. los angeles in like 19 uh i don't know what it was uh 90 uh in 19, late 80s early you know 1990 you could actually survive on these little advances maybe you had a part-time job or something and yeah we were writing for a lot of different trying to get cuts for different artists and learning about production it was kind of like our music school really because yeah the guy who signed us didn't put a lot of heat on us and let us kind of experiment and, and just turn in our songs and kept picking up the option. And then during this deal is when I ran into uh, the guys, Mike and Joey, and, and we kind of started Dada. And that took me off in a slightly different direction. Um, yeah, the, uh, the the Nirvana thing kind of hit Dada over the head because we were very melodic and there was a lot of harmony. And yeah. then they put up with... with um, with that sound and kind of, you know, pushed the melodic end of rock a little. I mean, he, Cobain had great melodies, but you yeah, know, yeah, a dirty sound, and our sound was much cleaner than that. Um, so it was a tough time to uh, to get noticed in the midst of all that. You know, when you have these Beatlesque harmonies and everything's going in the other direction, but you know, we still were able to break through and have. Oh, absolutely, it. absolutely, because you guys broke after Nirvana hit, though. Uh, we broke in. in uh, it was 92, 93. Yeah. So yeah. Right so yeah, they, yeah. They came out in 90, but when yeah. you guys, I mean, we guys formed I and mean, it was cause I mean, that's in the, that's at the tail end of the quota, as much as I hate the term quote unquote hair model on the right. sunset strip scene. Um, that's were right. you guys influenced at all by that scene? Not really. We Not were, really. Okay. It was always outside of our comfort zone. You know, it was, we didn't have the hair for it. Uh, <laughs> Although I did have a little more of those days. I mean, no, you know, we were the, the that just wasn't where we were coming from. We were more based in the the roots, 60s and 70s kind of classic rock was a big part, you know, of our base, you know, of our upbringing and our uh and the basis of our sound. So the hair, the hair metal, the 80s sunset strip days, that was always like, I I, I don't know how I can fit into that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And uh you know, but now I have a more of an appreciation for it, I think, than I did then, you know? Yeah. Well, the only reason I ask is because I, I know there's a lot of people that, you know, they were, that's the route they were going down. And then when Nirvana hit, they completely changed what they did. And that was like before they got signed or anything. So they kind of were able to adjust. And you guys, I always considered you guys like college rock. If yeah. That makes, that's a good you way know, to look at it. You know, yeah. um, not, not because, dude, I'm a, I'm a kiss geek. I'm a Van Halen geek. I'm, you know, I'm into all that, that, you know, mm -hmm. the eight, the eighties hard rock stuff. So it's like, sure. I knew the song and, and I knew the, the bands that you guys sounded like, you know, so it right. wasn't really in my wheelhouse, not that right. it was bad at all. And it, it's so funny when I say Dada, people get you confused, confused with DAD. Oh yeah. Do you remember those guys? Dizzy yeah, after sure. dark. Yeah. 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 You know, our thing was was high fidelity. It was uh, close harmony singing. You know, like I always compared it like if Simon and Garfunkel and Jimi Hendrix had a band together, that would be kind of art because we have a shredding lead guitarist. But then yeah. two guys that are singing very close two part harmonies and sometimes three part harmonies. And there's also this kind of cream element and police element, the trio thing, the power trio. So there's all those. Those are the mix of um of influences for us yeah yeah well you know and i always band like i consider like that as king's x right yeah they were contemporaries of ours and we share some audience there's people that are fans of both as a matter of fact i was always thought that'd be a great bill to go out on uh would be dada yeah it would, would be a, a, an audience that can relate there's rush people like dada too that's which is always kind of weird because it, it's not as technical as uh as rush but yeah but, they seem to like it because it's a little bit heady, I think. And that's what the appeal is for, for that kind of music fan. Yeah. I always say I can't count past Peter Chris. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, how long, so how long after you guys got together, did you guys get signed and, and were able well, to didn't take long. When I, I got in the band um, 91, I guess. And within six months, 
uh, there was a record deal on the table uh, from IRS, which was a big, you know, indi- a, 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 a prominent independent label in yeah. uh, LA at the time that had, you know, uh, uh, some pretty cool music. The Go-Go's, uh, R.E.M., the early records, um, you know, Stan Ridgeway, Walla Voodoo. Uh, they were funky and eclectic label, and it, it was a, a good place for... Uh, for Dada to be, although the label was really on its way out by the time we yeah. got there, you know, by, and by 1996, they were, they were all done. Um, and uh, we found out while we were on tour that our label just closed up, closed business. And so we had to come home from that one, but you know, all, and, it, but what I would say, like, they're all gone, but we're still here, you know, no, we exactly. All- exactly. And then you went to MCA, which is, uh, I know a lot of bands have went there to die. Yeah, the it's Music Cemetery the, of America. <laughs> yeah. There it is. Yeah, there's a band out of Minneapolis called Slave Raider. And right. uh, that's one of the reasons they think they didn't go anywhere is because they were on MCA. Yeah, MCA uh, was, uh, oh, we we got brought in by the president, which was which was good on one level. But, you know, th- this is kind of inside baseball with record deals, too, at least back then. The president of IRS ended up over at uh, MCA, brought us in there. And but the problem with that is, is that, you know, we're his favorite, but all the staff, all the people, the A&R department, they don't they didn't sign us. So yep. you've got that kind of I mean, there's so much politics in it. It's like everything has to be on the right, working together to make something happen. Yeah. And, you know, at least back then it did. Things are obviously totally different now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're operating completely independently now. But in those days, it was record deal with nothing. You know, I mean, that yeah, was it. Yeah, yeah. that was the whole game. I mean, we didn't know how to. Who, how, how could you put your music out? You didn't, you know, you could press up your own records, but how could you get them distributed? I mean, it was like you needed a record deal yep. now, not so much, but we're still trying to overcome the same issues, financing and anonymity. You know, those are the two, like, how do you spread your message? How do you cut through and how do you pay for it? That's what all artists are dealing with. Yeah. Well, I think that we're at, at this weird time where anybody can put a record out, which right. is great. But anybody could put a record out. It's the same thing with podcasting. I mean, I jokingly named this show another fucking podcast in 2013. And now everybody does have a fucking podcast, yeah. you know? So it's yeah, like, yeah. dude, it's tough. I know. it. I mean, we did one and in, in, during the lockdown, we we started a podcast. We were just trying to think of things to do, you know, yeah. ways to connect with our fans. So we did a podcast remote, my partner and I, and we interviewed all of our friends, you know, all of our yeah. music and brought on and we did actually do a, a great interview with miles copeland our old label president oh wow that's bad which is pretty interesting because um you know to hear his recollections of the time it's called the seven horse nation podcast and to hear him talk about his career first of all which is really fascinating but also his involvement with us and you know and, and we had an opportunity to like go hey you guys screwed it up. What happened? You know, we gave you a hit record and you didn't take it all the way home to put him under the gun a little bit, which yeah. you know, rarely you get a chance to do. But um, yeah, he hardly remembered us. So <laughs> I mean, he remembered us, but I, I asked him, do you remember what Dada sound, sounded like? And he's like, no, not really. You know? <laughs> <laughs> How yeah. hard was it? Um, at, Cause you, you guys had the hit. Yeah. Um, and they always say you have your whole life to write that first record and then you're basically on your own after that um how hard was it did you guys feel the pressure to have to follow up sophomore jinx yeah, yeah sophomore jinx. that's that's a real thing man you do you you spend your whole all of your experience your entire life to put that first record out and you put everything you've got into it and then it hits and the label turns around and says we need another one right now and it was yeah. usually we don't have anything, you know, we got to So yeah, there's a lot of pressure to, uh, to come up with something and, you know, we didn't give them what they were looking for. Um, so, I mean, we gave them a good record that, uh, yeah. that our fans really like, but they, you know, that's in a time things were changing and the market changes and what they want to spend money on. I mean, there's so many factors. Um, but yeah, I remember that time that was a very pressurized time because we had just come off of 15 months on the road promoting our first record i mean we were everywhere yeah and then you got to run back in the studio and try to come up with something something new and uh, there are some good songs there'll be some songs on that record that we're going to play on saturday night can't wait Um, but um yeah it's a it's a real thing man when when you're under that gun do you i mean 
do you like it now though, with not having to have that pressure and just being able to write whatever the hell you want to write? Or do you think that pressure is a good thing? Yeah. You know, that's interesting. Cause I think there's a little bit of both there. I mean, I always kind of, you know, when we make a record, we just put out seven horse, put out a record called the last resort. Um, oh, nice. Uh, in, uh, what is it? October of, or November of last year. And, um, every time we make a record or put something out, the intention is to connect with as many people as you possibly can. And every yeah. new thing you do, you know, you feel like this is the best thing that you've ever put out or else you wouldn't be putting it out. Um, but yeah. And the, what I miss about those days uh, is the support that you had from when the company was behind you. Yeah. You know, your job was to go out and make, do the thing, play the show, write the music, record it. This is what, how we grew up in, in, in that era of record it wasn't about being a content creator being a self marketer you know yeah. now you need a marketing degree really to be a musician um or you're expected to be an expert marketer when that's not really a skill set that we no. you know we're, we're more a lot of times musicians are more introverted and the way we want to communicate to people is through the music you know like we don't want to be we don't want to be sharing everything about ourselves outside the scope of our creations, yeah. which is what we put our entire heart and soul into to communicate. So it, it changed the game for sure. And I miss those days of like the record company is, is doing all of this stuff and you're going out on the road and playing shows. And that was your life. Uh, there's certainly more independence now and we don't have to, we don't need approval to put anything out. I mean, they rejected yeah. our first record at IRS. The first version of it that we turned in, yeah. the one with the hit on it. I mean, Miles Copeland, he hated Disneyland. He didn't want it on the record. And there was an internal battle at IRS between mm -hmm. the president, Jay Boberg, and Miles about, I don't want this on the record. And Jay's like, but this is the single. I mean, they were going at it. And it almost didn't come out. Um, wow. But... Uh, thankfully cooler heads prevailed and Disneyland came out and was a hit and miles, you know, uh, rightly so said, okay, I was wrong on that one. Um, but now, man, you know, the responsibility, as you know, is, is we, ha is in total marketing, the, sh the, the gigs, selling the records, producing. We, we, I got a box of, you know, I got vinyl over here that we just received that. We're, oh, nice. We're, we're, uh, we're signing it. Let me show you one actually. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah. Uh, this is our new one. This is the last resort. Okay, nice. Came from the from the the pressing plant, um, and you know we did it uh, on uh, pre sale with our hardcore audience, and um, you know you make a very small number of them, but it's a cool product. But it's not like you don't move them in the. It's not you can't make money on it. No. I mean, it's not something that you, <laughs> no. this is a this is a gift really to the fans you know yeah. this is something to give them that they can but 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 what's cool about it is this really is the physical representation of what we all do this is the stuff that got us started when we were kids yeah it's having something like this to hold on to and to, to look at I and mean, i can remember hours and hours just staring at back covers and listening to records you know that's what it's really about that's the essence of what it is to be a songwriter musician you know is to create something like that so i'm happy to have them um you know it's totally different than it was yeah well then. it's like i think the thing with vinyl and, and you know even cds but not cds not as much as like there's a connection with yeah. the music you know you because you know you're reading the reading the liner notes you're reading the lyrics and you're just staring right. at that gatefold of kiss alive too, just wishing you were there exactly you know what i mean yeah um you know it, it, it's not like that when you're on spotify that's for sure it's a totally different experience so for those people that that like to go there we make these products you know these limited run very special really curated uh records on high grade, you know, 180 gram vinyl with original artwork on the on the label. I mean, and, and a package that really tries to just to illustrate the whole aesthetic of what the band is about. Nice. And the, the, you will have those available on Saturday. Yeah, we're going to have some down there. Sure. And you guys going to be down there signing them for the person? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. So I mean, that's another thing. It's like you have to you will you, you must connect with. Yeah. With, yeah. You have to. 
when when do you think that when did that change for you guys? Did, were you one we of those been, man, you out you were always out there no matter what? Always, always out from day one. We were out there. We were outside the bus, backstage, you know, out in the parking lot. We were down at the merch table. We were we we were doing that before it was. We never had the sort of entourage running us out of the building security thing. We we never did that. We were we've always been, and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, we have such a a devoted fan base that goes back that long. Because when you make those connections to people yeah. in those moments, they last forever. Because there's a lot of people who think there's you know the the era that we're in now kind of takes away the mystique. Of the quote unquote uh, rock star, you know. Yeah. I mean, I would agree with that to an extent. I mean, especially with the with the uh, oversharing on social media. I yeah. Mean, you know, I mean, we've been told by marketing people like there is no forget mystique. There is no mystique anymore. Yeah. Um, and I miss it to a degree. I mean, we always straddle the line because we were very accessible, but at the same time, you're up there doing something that people are looking at like it's a magic trick, you know. Yeah. So you do have that going for you. Uh, that there's this aura of the band, the 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 ability of a band to make an original sound. Um, and a very unique sound because I've heard people covering our songs and they don't sound like us doing it. <laughs> um, so, but we always, we always made an effort and, you know, I got, I had some experiences a couple of times. I like, I met George Harrison one time in the bathroom at Warner brothers records when I was doing a temporary job at Warner. That was one of my last real jobs. I worked uh -huh. at Warner records in Burbank for a while and uh, this was in the late 80s. I was just a kid. And uh, he was in town uh, doing press for his album, Cloud Nine, which had that song that got my mind set on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So he's at Warner's doing press. And there are, people are all over the place. You can't get anywhere close to him, right? And I see him go into the men's room. And I go, this is my shot. So I go into the men's room because I'm a gigantic Beatles fan. Ring yeah. Out my guy everything you know the whole like like a lot of people and i walk through the men's room i charge in there and as i come through the threshold of the door i realize that it's just me and george harrison in the men's room at warner and he's taking a piss he's at the urinal <laughs> got his back to me he's doing his yep. business and i freeze like what do i do now now i'm in here i gotta i can't just watch this guy <laughs> so i you know <clears throat> hi george uh, I, I love you. Could, could you, you know, I, I gave him the whole spiel and he, I was like, would you sign this for me? And he like looks over his shoulder and, you know, he goes, sure. If you let me finish this first. <laughs> yeah. I was just shocked. And and he was so kind to me to take that. I mean, he could have just said, get out of here, you know, yeah, get, throw it away. Take, take off. A, taking a piss. But he was super cool. And I never forgot that, you know, and it's like that moment to me was so important in my life to meet him to have that little exchange with him it was so important it was so critical because i had grown up thinking about him and his music almost every day of my life since i was old enough to think i'm sure like you with whatever kiss or van halen or whatever it was like that with me with the beatles even though i'm a little bit late on the beatles thing as far as you know they were already, in 1970 they broke up i was five years old yeah yeah uh, but i i got into it and there he was, and he was kind to me, and he didn't blow me off, and I never forgot it. And I always thought, if I'm ever in the, if I ever have a moment where tables are turned, and I'm not saying that I'm on that scale, but I have had right. some moments where people have, as we all have in music, people are fans. They're fans. They don't, you know, care how big you are. But that led me to, to be, try to be like that. You know, try to give that moment to people because uh, that's all, that's really what else can we give them? The music, yeah. these moments, and and that's a great con contribution to a better world in a way. Well, dude, that's great, and I am so fucking excited for Saturday. You don't even know. Good, and uh, if people, Phil, if you want to, uh, they want to order the music, they want to order the order the vinyl. If they can't come to the shows, uh, where can they get all that stuff? Well, we're gonna as soon as we. Uh, everything's up on sevenhorsemusic.com. Uh, the records aren't available online yet, but they're about to be because we just got them in and we want to satisfy our pre-orders and get those yeah. out and then put the remainder of the run. It's only a hundred uh, LP run. That's it. Oh, wow. 
very limited edition. So we'll have them at the show, but uh, you can get all of our stuff at uh, sevenhorsemusic.com. Uh, there's some Dada uh, merch there as well. Uh, tickets for the show are available there uh, as well, or you can get them at the box office. I also want to say, if you're a, if you're holding a SAG, AFTRA, or WGA uh, union card, if you happen to be in the union and on strike at this time, I'm a SAG AFTRA member. So we, with together with uh, Golden Voice, the promoter, we uh, are proud to offer five dollar tickets to the show for striking union. Oh, members. that is um, badass! We uh, support the strike, so I'd love to spread that message as much as possible. Um, we one hundred percent support this strike, um, and as a union member, I can tell you that the issues are real, and uh, and uh, we it's a high time. This is a critical. Yeah. Critical moment because we see we saw what happened to musicians when yes. students came in. We were Amen. not organized. We had no. We put up no resistance, yep. and they just steamrolled us. And now yep. we're sitting here, you know, trying to get royalties and trying to up the rates, and it's 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 late. So this is a big moment um, in regards to streaming technology, AI technology, and actors and voices, and it's it's an important and and it has implications for people far beyond the entertainment mm -hmm. industry. So in support of this strike, we wanted to get people in there and give them a night out. And and Golden Voice said, how about five bucks? And we said, you know, great. And those are just only available at the door? Or are they uh, all? Yeah, I think you got to yeah, show, you have to show your the card. Yeah, show okay, the card that makes sense. That makes sense. So I'll make sure to get the word out about that. Um, and trust me, dude, I, it, I, I, I'm not a SAG after guy, but you know, I've done background work. I've, you know, I've, I've been there. I've done some of that stuff. Yeah. So I, I completely understand. And people, I think people don't realize that it's not about Tom Cruise. It's exactly. about everybody else. Yeah, it's not millionaires know? versus billionaires. It's right. about, it's about uh, middle class people trying to achieve middle class. Because in this town where I am in Los Angeles, I mean, 86% of the union membership doesn't qualify for the health plan. People just, yeah. you know, don't get it. It's not, it, yeah, the movie stars, they're all fine. Yeah. But everybody below the line is just a regular person, blue collar yeah. worker. You know, that's all that we are. We're just regular blue collar workers. Hollywood, LA is no different than anywhere else in the country in that regard. Right. I mean, people look at Los Angeles, like it's so phony you know la la land and all that look this is a town where there's a lot of creative people that are striving to make to to make their contribution but they're not all rich and famous most of them no. a vast majority of them are not right exactly and like musicians we don't get paid for gigs out there for the most part right you know so, comics <laughs> oh you want to get paid yeah. to do comedy all oh, that's they, they get five bucks to get up and do a set or whatever it is 20 yeah. bucks i mean it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's just it, ridiculous. the entertainment business the artists have always I've always been shit on. Let's be honest. The record yeah. industry was started as a uh, criminal enterprise, essentially, uh, in a lot of ways. You know, mob run, people stealing songwriting credit, publishing, all this stuff, paying, giving artists a Cadillac as their uh, royalty. You know, yeah. and, and I mean, that that was the early days. It was it was started like that. Um, and now we're in this uh, streaming era where, you know, People are making where there's, I mean, as we saw, uh, even a guy at Snoop Dogg's level going, where, where's the money? I got a billion stream. Yep. Where's the money? So these these are real issues. And, um, you know, we, we, we stand in support of uh, aver everyday people trying to make a living in uh, their chosen field. I mean, people, I see people commenting online. It's like, you know, they can stay on strike forever. But I don't think they really mean that because no. we all consume, we all consume these creative things we watch television we listen to music it's like yep we just take care of the artists a little bit <laughs> I mean, no exactly look if you want that strike to keep going on you're going to be watching the real housewives of izzy presley's apartment and there's no housewives it's just going to be me cooking in my underwear so uh good luck on that phil this has been a fucking blast izzy, um, my can, pleasure man cannot wait to physically meet you in person on me saturday too. Yeah, and uh, there's there's rumors that there may be a little pre and post game party at the Rainbow next door. Wouldn't doubt it. Because I, I mean, win in Rome. Got to. Yeah. You know what it is. Let me hit the outro music here, and I will uh, will uh, say goodbye off the air yeah. if you have a minute to hold on. Sure. All it. right. 
Thank you, man. Peace out. Thank you. Phil Levitt, everybody. Seven Horse, sevenhorsemusic.com. And of course, Dada, that big reunion is happening this Saturday night at the Roxy Theater at the beautiful Sunset Strip of Hollywood, California, ladies and gentlemen. Come on down, and you heard it. SAG AFTRA, Writers Guild, bring your cards down, and you will, if you're on strike, you will get in that door for $5. Ladies and gentlemen, $5. Dollars. Run, do not walk to the ticket office on Saturday night, ladies and gentlemen. That is all you need to know. I will be back next week. Hopefully, uh-oh. Hi. So get in the shop. You're going to be in there the shop. He is. There he is. No one tells me anything around here. It's Joey Callio. Joey Callio, everybody. I thought Peter Chris was popping his face in. And that would have <laughs> been awesome, too. Wouldn't be the first time I was accused of that. Hey, I, I told that to uh, uh, Ty Tabor once. He was like, dude, that's not cool. He just said I have this Peter Chris. That's not cool fucking with me of course but we'll see you guys on saturday night next week hopefully a drunken summit uh cherry pie versus open up and say ah versus cinderella's long cold winter shall be glorious cross my fingers see you guys then my name is izzy presley this has been another fucking podcast ladies and gentlemen what i lack in talent i make up for in the cock